As I mentioned last week, we uh, uh, asked not to uh, sing uh, in our gatherings for worship at the moment, and so I'm reading praise from Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, for the Lord is, a, is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth, the height of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation, and said it is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So that's God's blessing on us. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great privilege that is ours of being numbered amongst the people of God. We thank you that you have shown us great and mighty works, your deliverance of your people in Old Testament days. How often, Lord, in grace and power, you intervene to save and deliver your people. And we thank you for that greatest deliverance of all, that which has been purchased by the coming of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in his living and his dying in the place of sinners. We thank you for the glory of his resurrection, that he lives now in the power of an endless life, and we may know him and, and have life in your Son. We pray that as we hear your word today, as we have been reminded in the Holy Scriptures that we should not harden our hearts so that it meets with unbelief, but grant that it would be as seed sown in good soil that brings forth a harvest a hundredfold to the glory, honour and majesty of your great and holy name. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We'll continue our readings in Exodus and chapter 39. And then later from Romans chapter 12, Exodus chapter 39 and Romans chapter 12. Let's hear the word of God. Of the blue, purple and scarlet thread they made garments of, of ministry for the ministering in the holy place and made the holy garments for Aaron as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold, blue, purple and scarlet thread and of fine woven linen. And they beat the gold into thin sheets and cut it into threads to work in it in with the blue, purple and scarlet thread and fine linen into artistic designs. They made shoulder straps for it to couple it together. It was coupled together at its two edges. And the intricately woven band of his ephod that was on it was of the same workmanship, woven of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And they set onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold, and they were engraved as signets are engraved with the names of the sons of Israel. He put them on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he made the breastplate, uh, artistically woven like the workmanship of the ephod of gold, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen. They made the breastplate square by doubling it. A span was its length and a span its width when doubled. And they set it in four rows of stones. A row with a sardius, a topaz, and an emerald was the first row. The second row, a turquoise, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst. The fourth rows, row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They were enclosed in settings of gold in their mountains. They were twelve stones according to the names of the sons of Israel, according to their names engraved like a signet, each one with its own name according to the twelve tribes.' 
and they made chains for the breastplate at the ends, like braided cords of pure gold. They also made two settings of gold and two gold rings, and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And they put the two braided chains of the gold in the two rings on the end of the breastplate. The two ends of the two braided chains they fastened in the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. And they made two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate on, on the edge of it, which was on the inward side of the ephod. They made two other gold rings and put them on the two shoulder straps underneath the ephod towards its front, right at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod. And they bound the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings on the ephod with a, sh with a blue cord so that it would be above the intricately woven band of the ephod and that the breastplate would not come loose from the ephod as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the robe of the ephod of wo woven work all of blue and there was an opening in the middle of the robe like the opening of a coat of mail with a woven binding all around the opening so that it would not tear. They made on the hem of the robe pomegranates of blue, purple and scarlet and of fine woven linen. And they made bells of pure gold and put the bells between the pomegranates on the hem of the robes all around between the pomegranates. A bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate all around the hem of the robe to, to minister in as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made tunics, artistically woven of fine linen for Aaron and his sons, a turban of fine linen, exquisite hats of fine linen, short trousers of fine woven linen, and a sash of fine woven linen with blue, purple and scarlet thread made by a weaver as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold and wrote on it an inscription like the engraving of a signet. Holiness to the Lord. And they tied it, uh, they tied to it a blue cord to fasten it above on the turban as the Lord had commanded Moses. Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so they did. And they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its furnishings, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars and its sockets, the covering of ram skins dyed red, the covering of badger skins and the veil of the covering, the ark of the testimony with its poles and the mercy seat, the table, all its utensils and the showbread, the pure gold lampstand with its lamps, the lamps set in order, all its utensils and the oil for light, the gold altar, the anointing oil and the sweet incense, the screen for the tabernacle door, the bronze altar, its grate of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the laver with its base, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its sockets, the screen for the court gate, its cords and its pegs, all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting, and the garments of ministry to minister in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and his son's garments to minister as priests. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did all the work. Then Moses looked over all the work, and indeed they had done it, as the Lord had commanded, just so they had done it. And Moses blessed them. And then from the epistle of Paul to the Romans, in chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all members, all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. 
Having then gifts according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches, in teaching. He who exhorts, in exhortation. He who gives, with liberality. He who leads, with diligence. He who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love, in honour giving preference to one another. Not lagging in dil diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink, for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's come now to God in prayer. Let us all pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder from your word today that you are a God who bids us draw near to you. We thank you that we can draw near to the God of heaven and earth, the God who has made us, the God who sustains us, who provides for us day by day, the God who in the Lord Jesus Christ has provided a perfect redemption for all his people. We thank you for that glorious redemption that the Lord Jesus Christ has come, the fulfilment of all the promises, all that the tabernacle spoke of, all that that uh, form of worship spoke of has been so gloriously fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the other promises, the promise of rest to the people of God being fulfilled in our glorious Saviour. We thank you that he is the end of the works of the law for the people of God, but that by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone we may receive a justification that is full and free and final. We bless you then for this great Redeemer, and we thank you that we come today in the simplicity of New Testament worship, that we don't come uh, with a prescribed building and all the form and the glory of the Old Testament that has passed away, but in the simplicity of New Testament religion, by faith alone, in the word of God, and all your promise and instruction to us, we draw near with confidence, knowing that you will receive us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for that better sacrifice uh, that he has made, the offering of his precious blood of infinite value and worth, the end of all other sacrifices, their fulfilment being found in that one great moment on the cross of Calvary when the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, offered up himself a perfect sacrifice for our sins. We thank you there. We see the depth of our degradation, the depth of our rebellion, that it was the very blood of the very Son of God alone that could atone for our sins. And there we see the depth and the glory of the love of God that he would give his only begotten Son that we might be redeemed. We thank you for your word of promise that you, your love for us is eternal and infinite and unchanging, that it doesn't rest, it doesn't rest upon any worth in the works of our hands. You've bidden us given, give all those things up. Uh, but the rest on your promise and your gracious invitation 
and the sacrifice, the blood of your only begotten Son. We thank you that you bid us also to leave behind the works of the flesh, uh, to walk in those ways that are pleasing in your sight. And here we find satisfaction for our souls. We bless you, gracious God, uh, that we may know the fullness of God, that we may enter into that, find our satisfaction there, uh, an adequacy that is found in nothing and nowhere else uh, but in God himself. Help us to enter into that rest today, to embrace it by faith and to know in the Lord Jesus Christ that great integrating work, uh, making us uh, the people of God and making us all that we ought to be uh, in, in uh, our Saviour. We do pray, Lord, for your mercies to be extended uh, in our day and generation to our land. We, Lord, are so conscious that we still are meeting only under severe restrictions, and we see the restrictions that are necessary because of this ongoing uh, virus and its effects in our land. We see it affecting other lands in the most appalling way. Pray that we might soon know a deliverance from it. We ask your wisdom and grace to be granted to all those who are labouring to find an answer, to find a vaccine, to find cures that are effective, uh, that normal life may be resumed uh, in the nations and especially that our freedom and liberty to worship you aright uh, may be uh, upheld and restored. We ask for your church in this day and generation. We thank you for the preaching of the gospel that is continuing and has continued in our land by means of the internet and literature and personal testimony. And we ask that in this day and generation, your word would be powerfully effective in the lives of many people, that those who presently are living with fear, fear of contracting something that might bring about their demise, that they may know deliverance from bondage to the fear of death uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who brings eternal life uh, to, to light in his gospel and abolishes death. Have mercy then upon our nation, O Lord. Give to our leaders wisdom and grant that they would uh, direct the affairs of our nation uh, to the very best of ends. Pray that law and order and peace would continue in our land, that you would, Lord, uh, frustrate the desires of those who would sow discord and disharmony in our nation and so uh, disturb the peace have mercy upon us O Lord that we might live as your word has declared quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness and reverence help us to live day by day in the fear of God and to have that mark upon us as your holy people be gracious to those of the congregation particularly with needs you know our our own lives you know our families our concerns for our children and our children's children, for other relatives, for friends and neighbours and work colleagues. We pray, Lord, that you'd hear the petitions of our heart as we offer in supplication, Lord, uh, the needs of, of our loved ones. Hear us and deliver them, we pray. Be gracious to us also as we hear your word to us today. May it come with power and grace. May we be uh, more greatly conformed to the image of your Son, having heard your word with a sincere and a believing heart. Help us to walk in its light and to know its transforming power and grace uh, moment by moment as we ask these mercies for your namesake and glory. Amen. Amen. Well, let's turn again now to uh, Hebrews and chapter 3, and we'll continue our studies uh, in this great epistle. This book was written to weakened Christians, you remember, uh, who were on the, the very verge of giving up and going back to their old lives. The book is the most effective antidote there is to spiritual malaise, to backsliding, uh, to the cooling of our affections, because it repeatedly holds before us the Lord Jesus Christ in these in the glory and the greatness that is his, the majesty that belongs to our great Saviour. That's 
the, the great theme that binds together the entire epistle. Uh, the absolute supremacy of the Lord Jesus as the prophet and priest and king of his believing people. And the scripture deals with our spiritual malaise, our sickness in that way, because there is no other effective answer and antidote to spiritual sickness. Whatever else we might need in life, it is a new vision of Jesus, a, a, a renewed appreciation of the glory of the Saviour that is the answer to our spiritual difficulties. The answer lies then not in us looking in so much, examination and being introspective, but the answer lies in looking out and looking up to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the author stresses over and over again the majesty of Christ and repeatedly, time after time, it tells us that Jesus Christ, all that he is, all that he has, all that he does is better. That's the repeated word through the epistle. He is better than the angels. He is better than the prophets. He is better than Moses. He is better than Aaron. He is better than the Levitical priesthood. And on and on the author goes uh, in that vein. He gives a better hope. He makes a better covenant. He gives better promises. He offers a better sacrifice. He sets our heart uh, intent on reaching a better country. In everything, Jesus is better. That's the message of this book. And uh, this letter then is write, written to these believers who are in danger of apostasy, of abandoning the faith in face of persecution and pressure uh, from those who are opposing their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is writing then to encourage them, to exhort them always to endure, to persevere in the Christian life. So that's, that's the nature of the the problem, that's the people to whom he is writing. Uh, they are people who are under significant pressure. They are being brought to the point of deep discouragement. They're being confronted by significant physical, mental and spiritual distress. And as a result, they're beginning to lose heart. They're in danger of slipping away, he says, of losing that perseverance that always must be a distinguishing feature of the people of God in their spiritual pilgrimage in this world. And so there were signs here and there of some of these people beginning to falter, uh, to give way in their Christian life and their Christian uh, profession. And so these Christians, the, right, uh, the writer sends to them this epistle that he describes uh, towards the end of the epistle as a word of exhortation. And it's an exhortation that is framed in several different ways. For example, in chapter 6, he pleads with them, let us go on. They, they were slowing down. They were coming to a standstill. They were even beginning to slip back. And he says, let us go on. In chapter 12, he says, let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. There are these numbers of exhortations. Let us hold fast the confession of our faith. Let us consider one another. Uh, and so there are these repeated ex exhortations to go on, to persevere, to endure in the Christian life, addressed to these people now who, it would appear, are inclined to fall back, to go back to their old lives, to lose heart. And then we can also say that the epistle contains not only exhortations, but what jo John Owen calls dehortations. In other words, exhortations to avoid something. A warning, a plea to renounce and leave something that we are in danger of imbibing uh, to ill effect. So these exhortations are both encouragements and warnings. Encouragements on the one hand, uh, let us run the race uh, 
that is before us, looking unto Jesus and so on. That's the great encouragement. But alongside the encouragement, warnings again and again. Take heed. Take heed lest such and such a thing happen to you. And here we come to a, a dehortation, uh, a warning. For example, in chapter 3 and verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Chapter 4 and verse 1, Since therefore a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. Now these warnings are sounded throughout the epistle, but especially in this chapter, chapter 3 and into chapter 4, by a, a straightforward exposition of Scripture. Now that's very significant, and it's important that we, we notice and take that into account. Do you have a professing Christians who are in spiritual danger? They are portraying the simple symptoms of spiritual sickness that is threatening to incapacitate them. And what is the answer to this spiritual sickness? The antidote to this spiritual sickness is to have Holy Scripture applied to it. And that's what we see the writer doing in chapter 3. Uh, Hebrews 3 is largely an application of that quotation there from Psalm 95, expounded to them and closely applied to these Hebrew Christians as he takes the truth of that psalm and presses it on their hearts and conscience and will as the people of God. And this is the way in which all manner of spiritual sickness is to be approached and diagnosed and treated taking the word of God and applying it. Because the only way, the one way in which God always deals most effectively with his people is by taking his word, the scriptures, and applying it to the heart, life, emotion, thinking, will, and conscience of the people of God. And that's what the writer does here, specifically taking then Psalm 95, as I've said, and its recollection of that period in Israel's history when they were in the wilderness. And the point he is making to these Christians to whom he's writing now in the first century is that they're in a situation very similar to that uh, that confronted the people in Psalm 95. That is, they're in a spiritual wilderness. So let's just read from verse 7 for a moment. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works forty, forty years. Therefore, I was angry with that generation and said, They always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, They shall not enter my rest. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end, while it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not the, all those who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that he, they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he had said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, 
and God rested on the seventh day from all his works, and again in this place they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains that some must enter it, and those who, to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience, he again designates a certain day, saying, In David today, after such a long time as it has been said, today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who has entered his rest for himself has himself also ceased from his works, as God did. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. So, it's a long exposition of Psalm 95. And as I say, this is the way in which all spiritual sicknesses are approached and diagnosed and treated. The application of the word of God uh, to us. To other people then in a spiritual wilderness. And seeing this, the writer takes up this account from the history of Israel in the wilderness in Psalm 95. That speaks of Israel hardening their hearts in rebellion when they put God to the test. And the point he's making is, where has God meant to lead the people of Israel through the wilderness to the promised land, into the land where they were to know the fullness of God's grace and blessing, his love, his power? Israel, instead, by their sinful disobedience, were stuck in the wilderness where they wandered for 40 years. And the warning of this passage is, take heed lest your life become like theirs. Lest your life become a wilderness. That's the warning. Take heed not to make your life a wandering in the wilderness like the children of Israel. Now, what is it that caused them to wander? What caused them to wander was their response to the word of God. To the love of God, to the blessing and the grace of God. It was their response to that that caused them to wander. They responded to those wonderful blessings that God lavished upon them in the most extraordinary way as he redeemed them from their bondage in Egypt. They responded to that with a hard, unbelieving heart. And that began to be evidenced in their murmuring against God, their rebellion. And their unbelief. And as a result, they went for 40 years wandering in the wilderness. And that solemn history, says the writer, stands as a warning to Christians, a warning against hardness of heart. Now, when particularly do we need to pay heed to this warning? The answer is, Verse 15, today. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion. So here's some, something we need to ask God to deeply impress upon our spirits today. Today means today. It is whenever we hear the voice of God. Whenever we hear God's voice, we need to ask that he will save us from this terrible spiritual sickness of turning towards him and his word a hard heart. Now such is the danger of hardness of heart that we are more prone to it than we imagine or realize. The danger of not taking God seriously and to offset and to combat that tendency by applying this passage to ourselves as readers is, is what, we need, uh, what we need. It's, it's as if he is debating with us in verses 16 through 19. You can see in those verses three questions in verse 16, 17 and 18. And these three questions are answered by three questions. They're, they're rhetorical questions. It's a, a literary device that he's using. He's asking and answering questions 
with, with questions. He says in verse 16, Who, having heard, rebelled? Who was it that heard the word of God and rebelled? Who were these people in the wilderness who rebelled? And the answer is, wasn't it all those whom God led out of Egypt by the hand of Moses? In other words, wasn't it that entire generation upon whom God had lavished such love and care, the people to whom he had sent Moses to deliver them from their bondage, people to whom he had declared his love and people whom he had redeemed from their slavery? Wasn't, wasn't it that generation that rebelled against God's word? Those are the people who spurned God's love and rebelled against his purpose. They're the ones who doubted the wisdom of God and refused to believe him and refused to trust his ways. And this writer is warning us of the same danger. If, if it could have been such a privileged people who turned against God with a, re a murmuring, rebellious spirit, rejecting his word in the face of such lavish grace, then let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. And we who have enjoyed infinitely greater privileges than the children of Israel, that generation, do we not need to pay more earnest heed to these things? We who have been redeemed by Christ's blood, don't we face a similar danger? That's what he's saying there in verse 16. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? And then he goes on. Now, with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? So the answer is that the people with whom God was grieved and made angry were those very people who had received the grace of God in redemption in Egypt, who had been brought up out of that bondage, and yet in their lives they had shown such rebellion and unbelief toward God that he made an example of them. He judged their sin, and he made an example of them. Their corpses littered the wilderness as a result. It's a warning that God, who had entreated en and cared for and loved and blessed this people, when they persisted in their rebellion, the God who had made them such a singular example of his grace made them also an equally similar, singular example of his judgment pouring out his wrath upon them in the wilderness. And you see the warning there. Throughout this epistle, we see that balance that is being carefully maintained between encouragements and warnings. Encouragements that arise out of God's grace and God's faithfulness, his sovereignty on the one hand, and then warnings about God's anger and judgment upon rebellion. And that's a note that we need to pay heed to. The warning that if we persist in rebellion against God, in a defiant, self-willed refusal to listen to him, to hear what he has to say to us, then we are provoking his anger against us. It's a very solemn and serious thing. And God presses that matter upon us in order to urge us to fear. Did you notice that in chapter 4 and verse 1? Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. So this writer isn't at all reticent or afraid of using this category of fear. We tend to be a little embarrassed. We tend to be a little bit reticent to speak of living in the fear of God. And of course, there is there is a fear that is unhealthy. And some Christians have used the notion of the fear of God in a very unhelpful and unhealthy way. But there is such a thing as the proper fear of God. That is healthy and health-giving. 
and a healthy fear of God's judgments because God's acts of judgments are very real. So who were these people? They were a privileged people. Who provoked him for 40 years? Those whose corpses fell in the wilderness, he says, an evidence of God's judgment on them. And then the third question, and to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? Did you notice there that he speaks of God going on oath? of swearing an oath to these people. In Scripture, usually when we read of God going on oath, it's an oath that is spoken of in order to give a sense of security and certainty to the people of God. It is given to provide assurance and an absolute solidity upon which we can build our lives and our hope. He swears, he makes a covenant, he enters into a covenant with an oath with his people. And so we sing, don't we, when we're allowed to, his oath, his covenant and his blood. Support me in the whelming flood. But here's an oath given as uh, an oath against unbelief. To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? but to those who did not obey. Now what God is saying to us here is this, that he is a God whose oath is sure, whose word is true and dependable and certain. And it's very important that we grasp the fact that we can take his word with utmost seriousness when we're reading his Bible uh, his word, when we are applying the truth of his word to our lives, we can take with absolute certainty, God never utters an idle word. He has never, like us, made an idle promise. We do that very often, don't we? We make promises that we don't keep. We make promises that very often, either through forgetfulness or neglect or deliberate choice, we don't keep those promises. God has never made an idle promise. But neither has he made an idle threat, ever. Many of us have heard idle threats. Many of us perhaps have made idle threats. Perhaps the children are being a bit fractious and you've said, you do that once more and I will and out comes the threat. And a few moments later they do it again and you say, just once more, that's all, just once more, and you'll see if I don't, and out comes the threat again. And the child knows, mum or dad, they're never going to do what they've threatened to do. They know it's idle, it's an idle threat. The solemn thing about passages such as this in Scripture is that God doesn't make idle threats, ever. Always he is faithful and true. He's faithful to his promises. He is equally faithful to his threats. For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who believed not? And the conclusion of the whole matter is, so we see, verse 19, that they could not enter because of unbelief. God's oath, then, is a warning against unbelief. And we are to notice just how often the writer here refers to unbelief again and again. It's striking here in chapter 3 and on into chapter 4. Uh, we're, we're told just how serious a matter it is. We tend not to speak of unbelief as if it's such a serious thing. Someone says that they don't believe and we, we might be tempted to think, well, it's a sort of amiable weakness on their part. Someone says, 
a family member or a friend or a work colleague. Oh, she's, she's not a believer. And we respond as if that's just so-so. But it's not just so-so. Because in Scripture, in the Bible, unbelief is associated with an evil heart. We see that in verse 12, don't we? Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So you see, just as the secret to perseverance and enduring and victory in the Christian life, just as the secret to that is faith, so the explanation of the failure of the children of Israel in the wilderness is their unbelief. And these two things are set up in contrast uh, to, to one another. So often uh, men and women of faith triumph in, in uh, chapter 11, for, for example, and uh, there are then the people whose corpses fell in the wilderness, an example of their unbelief failing to enter into the promised rest that God had set before them. And here then unbelief is defined as disobedience. It's not, you see, just, unbelief is not just a willingness to accept certain facts as true. Unbelief is a moral issue. Unbelief is an unwillingness to take God at his word. And you can see how in Scripture it's such a serious thing because it's a slander against God, against his character and against his name. It's a slander against God's integrity to meet his word with unbelief. When we don't take God at his word, we are slandering him. We're saying he's not to be taken seriously. When we say or think that a word isn't to be taken seriously from God, we're saying he isn't to be taken seriously. We're saying that he isn't to be trusted. We're saying God isn't to be believed. We're saying that God is a liar. That's what unbelief is. It's a moral issue. It's a moral matter and it betrays a heart that is fixed uh, in, in its resolve against God and to refuse his word. It's just what we see in the beginning, isn't it? In the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. It's the first temptation when God had lavished such care and love upon Adam and Eve and God gave to him this pledge and promise that everything he saw in the garden was for him to enjoy. He should enjoy it all, but there was the one tree, one fruit, which he was not to touch. And he was told, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. But Adam, Adam didn't believe God. And Adam defied God. And that's what it is to live in unbelief. It is to live as if God does not mean what he has said. Or as if he has never said it in the first place. As if God is a liar. Now when God sets down for us then an entire pattern of life for his children, to live then outside of that pattern is to live in unbelief and disobedience. To live by any other standard than that which we find in Scripture is to live in unbelief and disobedience. And that's why it's so serious a thing it is to have an unbelieving heart. It's an evil heart of unbelief, says the writer. A hard heart, a heart that has become so hardened that we will live our lives in God's world resisting the God who has made us. You harden your heart. That's how it happens. You harden your heart. You actively build a barricade around yourself. You fortify yourself against God and against his word, hardening your heart against him. That's just what Israel did in the wilderness. They wouldn't take God at his word and so they kept complaining to Moses and murmuring against God, constantly kept complaining, why have you brought us out here? We should never have left Egypt. Oh, if only we were back in Egypt again. 
It's very interesting, isn't it, and, and significant, I think, to notice that both what Adam and Eve in the garden, what Israel in the wilderness fortified themselves against by their unbelief was rest. That's what they were fortifying themselves against because the rest that they were to enter into and enjoy was the rest of fellowship with God. For the children of Israel, it was the rest of entering into Canaan, into God's land of promise. Again and again we read, they did not enter into their rest. And when Adam was driven out of the garden, you remember, he was turned out of the gardener to be a, out of the garden to be a wanderer. His son Cain later came under condemnation, and the condemnation was, or the judgment was, that he would be a vagabond wandering in the earth. And in that condemned way of life, he says of his punishment, "My punishment is greater than I can bear." Because he had lost the rest of fellowship with God. Now this rest that God had promised is another picture of his salvation, you see. The great salvation that God has promised. We've got several pictures of salvation in this epistle. We've already seen the, the picture of salvation as redemption out of bondage to the fear of death and Satan. That's one picture of salvation. Here's another salvation in this picture of rest and here we are told verse 18 the children of Israel did not enter into this rest because of unbelief for the Christian the rest is the eternal Sabbath of which we read in chapter 4 ultimately the new heavens the new earth and yet before that there is a glorious rest he says that remains for the people of God to which Jesus has invited us when he said come unto me all you who are wearied and heavy laden and I will give you rest now, it's a very significant thing that unbelief produces unrest we see that not only in scripture but we see it also in our own personal experience the reason for it is because the biblical idea of rest is the idea of finding our security in God complete absolute security in God it's the enjoyment of, per per uh, of perfect harmony between the creature and the creator and so biblical rest as I say it's a picture of salvation is rest in God and it's the rest that God prepares for his people so this rest isn't a rest of mere inactivity it's not the rest of the absence of trouble and so on but it's resting in God now chapter 4 presses on us this warning about failing to enter into the fullness of that rest chapter 4 verse 1 therefore since a promise remains of entering his rest let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it the promise in verse 1 is the promise that remains for the believer he says and here again is another way that this epistle teaches us to think about the relationship between the Old and the New Testament. The book does that in several different ways, as I suggested to you earlier in our studies. Sometimes it's the relationship of, of shadows to reality. Here it's promise and fulfillment. Now it's frequently seen, for example... Um, the, uh, the redemption of Israel out of Egypt God's dealings with his people in the wilderness and then when they'd come into the promised land God calling his people to himself and all, all that sort of uh, picture is, is a promise that isn't fulfilled until the coming of Christ and the fulfilment of the promise of rest is found in Christ fulfilled when he issues that urgent call come to me I will give you rest. And the writer says, this rest remains. We still have this promise, and it's fulfilled in Christ, and then ultimately in the eternal Sabbath that waits for us. And notice again that the living, uh, oh, sorry, that the thing that prevented the children of Israel from 
entering this life and into this rest, into this promise, was their relationship to the message they heard. It's the repeated note in the warning. He says in verse 2, chapter 4, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. Now that's important, isn't it? He says the same gospel preached to us was preached to them. It was the gospel of God's grace, preached to the children of Israel, redemption for them through shed blood. That's what distinguished them as a privileged people. The gospel was preached to them, as Paul says elsewhere, to them were given the oracles of God. And he says, this same gospel now comes to us. But what reception does it meet with? Verse 2, Indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. Now the fear that he encourages us to have in verse 1 is a fear lest we fail to enter into the rest that God has for his people because we receive the word of God but not with faith. We meet it with unbelief. We are to be afraid of that, he says. And again, I remind you that unbelief is not just uh, a mere, or, or should I say, belief is not just a mere intellectual acceptance of truth. It's not simply saying, well, yeah, I believe the Bible is God's word, I believe it's true. That isn't what it means to receive the word of God with faith. Receiving the word of faith means welcoming it, embracing it as the sword of the Spirit, as he goes on to describe in, in uh, verse 12 of, of chapter 4, where he says the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the, of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We're to receive it like that. And that's just what he says was happening as the writer applied Psalm 95 to these people. But it's possible to turn toward that, a hard, unrepentant heart, resisting the word of God. And the writer of this epistle then wants us to see that there's infinite loss involved in that. Now, I understand some might be asking in their minds this question, well, what's this loss? Is it eternal loss? Is he saying that if I disregard the word of God, refuse to receive it by faith, then I'll lose eternal salvation? Is that what the loss is? Well, you already know the answer to that. I don't need to dwell on that this morning. But really, you see, that isn't the right question to ask at all at this point. The proper to ask, uh, question to ask is, Lord, how can I take this warning seriously enough? If God has gone on oath, warning us about having an evil heart of unbelief toward his word, then the pressing question I need to ask is, am I turning an unbelieving heart towards his word? If these privileged people in Old Testament days did that, am I doing it? And we need to realise the loss that he speaks of here is real. Verse 2, indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. <coughs> so we are to fear now verses 3 to 5 assure us that through faith in God's word and promise it is possible to enter into rest. Verse 3 We who have believed do enter into that rest. As he said, so I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. Now that's a tricky sentence to understand. He goes on, although the works were finished from the foundation of, of the world. Uh, it's a bit tricky, that sentence. What he's saying is this. 
If God is still warning us about the possibility of failing to enter into his rest, then it must be that there is a rest into which we can enter. If he warns us, take heed so that you do not lose this rest, then it follows that there is a rest that we can enter into. And he gives a threefold picture here of this rest. I'll try and deal with it as quickly as I can, because our time is gone. There's, first of all, the creation rest that he speaks of in verse 4. He's spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains that some must enter it. You see, the warning is, they did not enter the rest speaks of the fact that there is a rest that we can enter by faith. They lost it through unbelief. You can possess it, he says, by faith. He says in verse 6, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter it because of disobedience, he again designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time as it has been said today, if you'll hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Do you see that? He says there is another day. Today, don't you harden your heart. Uh, for if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. See then, Canaan was also a picture of rest. Creation was a picture of it when God rested on the seventh day from his work. Not because he was tired, but because he was satisfied. He looked at it, all he had achieved, all he had done. He saw it was very good, and he rested, satisfied in the work that he had done. And the rest that God brings us into is satisfaction with God. It's rest in him, satisfied with who he is and what he's done. That's the great, you see, integrating factor of a needy personality. If you were disturbed, if you were out of sorts and restless, the ultimate answer to that condition is found in satisfaction in God. That's the key to subjective rest for a Christian. And when we try to find it anywhere else, we're going to be restless and out of sorts. Many Christians are restless. They're restless because they're seeking their rest and satisfaction outside of and apart from God. You might sing the hymn, Now none but Christ can satisfy, none other name for me, but do you live as if that's true? Is that what salvation has done for you? Brought you into rest? Has it brought you to find satisfaction in God? That's what the creation rest was all about, and it's what the Canaan uh, Canaan rest was to be like for God's people also. He had prepared a rest for them. It's as o almost as if God himself was excited about it. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. He says, press on to get to it. But before they got to it, they began to murmur. And they said, we know a better place to live. We know a better way to live. If only we were back in Egypt. Do you see? They weren't seeking and finding satisfaction in God. So creation rest is a picture of it, and Canaan rest is a picture of it, and the Sabbath day rest is a picture of it. He speaks of that in verse 9. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he who entered into his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. The institution of the Sabbath in Scripture is a picture of the rest that remains for the people of God. What was the Sabbath for? Well, it bore witness to two things. It bears witness to the gospel, because it tells us that as God rested and ceased from his labors, so man seeks re le uh, ceases from his labor to find his rest in God, and solely in God's grace. The Sabbath bears witness to the gospel, then, of saving grace. God stop working and we stop working. We rest in the full satisfaction of what God has done. But more than that, as God ceased from his labors, 
All who enter into his rest also cease from their labours, he says. Verse 10. Uh, he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of dis disobedience. Ceasing from our own works is ceasing from the works of the flesh, from self-will, from self-pleasing, so that we find rest in him. The Sabbath bears witness to that. A heart at rest in God from self. And that's why the Sabbath is such an important institution. The Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath, if you like, takes over from that Old Testament doctrine of the Sabbath. And it's a pity that in some places, Sabbatarianism uh, became such a cold and unattractive thing. You know, the idea that the only thing that matters is that you keep the habit of observing the Lord's Day. That's what matters, more than anything else. But gossiping, slandering about your neighbours, being a busybody in other people's affairs, being greedy, avaricious for money and possession, being lustful, those things don't matter, just so long as you keep the Sabbath day and you don't go to the shop and you don't whistle and you don't go to the park. The Sabbath is bigger than that, more glorious than that. The Sabbath speaks to us of a God of grace who proclaims his gospel that we cease from our labours and we glory in God find our satisfaction in him and the worship of him, taking time to come into his presence and to rejoice in Christ. We are to live in this day as those who have ceased from their labours and want to live in obedience to him, a day of faith. That's the Sabbath rest that remains for the people of God. And it's a great sadness that so many Christians spend the Lord's Day in such a way that they taste so little of what the Sabbath day is meant to be in terms of satisfaction in God. But there's another Sabbath he speaks of here very quickly. There's the creation Sabbath, uh, the Canaan Sabbath, the weekly Sabbath, the picture of the rest that God gives to his people, and the eternal Sabbath, which is probably what he's referring to when he says in verse 9, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. It's the Sabbath rest of glory. And, and there, in the most ultimate way, will we cease from our labour, except for the labour of glorifying God and worshipping him. That's the Sabbath rest in the New Jerusalem, into which place those of our brethren who have gone before have already entered into their rest ahead of us. So he says in verse 11, Therefore let us be diligent to enter that rest. Is that a contradiction? Some of the translations have let strive to enter the rest. Does that seem a bit odd? Strive to enter rest? It's interesting that he puts it like that and important to understand why. Because it underlines the fact that the rest that we enter into is not a rest of inactivity or passivity. The children of Israel were brought out of Egypt, given the promise to the land, a land flowing with milk and honey. How did they eventually enter the land under Joshua? Well, it was through conflict. It was through adversity. It was through facing onslaughts and assaults. They had to strive. And now he's saying to the people of God, to whom he's writing here, you must strive to enter into rest. You go on, you persevere in the Christian life, and you will find that the same Lord will give you rest. It's only a matter of time. It's obtained by living by faith, living in obedience until you enter into that rest. Jesus I am resting, resting in the joy of what you are. That's the way to live the Christian life. Hearing God's word with a believing heart, responding in faith and obedience to what he says. And so entering into rest. The Lord bless his word to us this morning. Let me.
read uh, a closing praise uh, before we are dismissed. Psalm 111. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. In the assembly of the upright and in the congregation, the works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. His work is honourable and glorious, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He, gave, he has given food to those who fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has declared to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are verity and justice. All his precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and righteousness. He has sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious God, our Heavenly Father, we bless you that not only are you there, but you have spoken. You have spoken through the prophets. You have spoken in these last days through your Son. And we have your word in our hand this morning, the truth, the verities of God. We pray that we might ever receive these words with a believing heart and that that believing, uh, that faith would be worked out in our lives in obedience day by day so that we might find our satisfaction and our rest in all that you are and all you have done for us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant these things to be written on our hearts as we ask it in his name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Amen.